As some of you may remember, I bought four motherboards from eBay that were described as not powering on. The first one had a failed chipset. The second one had a shorter capacitor and a dodgy MOSFET, but I got it working. The third one was the HP Pavilion motherboard, which I spent a lot of time on, but still didn't get working. This is the Ford motherboard, which is from a Dell XPS 15 9560. And I need to get this fixed to have a 50% win. However, I can see we have a big problem with that. If you look at this motherboard, you can see that it's very obviously got a spill. Not only here, but also here, here, a little bit here, a little more there, a good bit here, and all over this part of the board as well. So I'm not even going to try and plug this in. What I'm going to do first is obviously clean it off with a bit of alcohol and a toothbrush and see how it looks then. Okay, I didn't think it was necessary to put up a video of how to clean off a board with alcohol. So I've just gone ahead and, and done it and I've scanned the board in again after cleaning. So this is what it looks like after I've cleaned the board. Let's zoom in on those parts where there was spill. So as you can see, there's small remnants on these two capacitors here, but other than that, it's pretty clean the whole way along. You may remember this section here was particularly bad, but it's actually cleaned up pretty well. And here it was spill all over this section here. So now that we've cleaned it off and there's no obvious signs of damage to any of the components, of course that doesn't mean that they're all working, but there's certainly no signs of damage. What should we do next? Now I'm actually quite surprised how well this board has cleaned up. I had presumed that when I had cleaned it down with alcohol that we would have found multiple blown components but that doesn't appear to be the case. It seems like if you were to look at the board right now you would think that there was no spill at all. It looks almost perfect. So what I've done is I've tracked down a schematic for this and as you can see we have the input section here from the barrel adapter and a second voltage input for USB type C adapter with PD control. Controller. Now my power supply can't talk to the PD controller so we're gonna have to use this voltage input right here. So before injecting voltage I'm just gonna carry out an initial check and confirm that there are no shorts on the board before this MOSFET, between the two MOSFETs and after this MOSFET and presumably across where there's a current sense resistor here. After I confirm there's no short on the input section I'm going to inject with my DC power supply at this point right here. So the first thing I need to do here is to locate this MOSFET and this is PQ200. Now there are a lot of components on both sides of this board but I managed to locate PQ200 is right here. Now as we saw in our schematic from our barrel adapter our DC input voltage comes on to pins 1, 2 and 3 of PQ200. So that is coming through these vias and onto 1, 2, 3 of PQ200. So where does it go from there? Well, presuming this MOSFET is turned on, our 19.5 volts should come through this MOSFET, leaves on the drain pins of PQ200 and then enters the drain pins of PQ201. And presuming PQ201 is switched on, it should leave it by the source pins and as you can see here it doesn't seem to go anywhere it just seems to go through these vias right here. So now that we know where our voltage comes in let's check and see if we have any shorts. So I want to introduce my multimeter in diode mode and I place my red probe to ground and with my black probe I'm going to check first of all at DC in. So I place it to the source pins of PQ200 and I find that the multimeter doesn't change, it stays on a well. Next I want to measure between these two MOSFETs so I place my probe on, well you can put it on either the drain pins of PQ200 or PQ201 so I place it on the drain pins of PQ200 and I find that the multimeter doesn't change, it still reads a well. Next I want to measure at the source pins of PQ201 so I place my black probe to either pins 1, 2 or 3 and I find that it measures 
Okay, so back to our schematic for a second. We're measuring OL in diode mode at 1, 2, and 3, so there's no short there. We're measuring OL between the two MOSFETs here, so there's no short there. And we're measuring 0 0.643 at pins 1, 2, and 3 of PQ201, so there's no short here either. So I just want to confirm at the current sense resistor um, that we don't have a short either. So it goes through two inductors here and then it's rebadged as SDC underscore in. So let's see if we can find that. So if we search for SDC in, okay, all right, here's the next instance of it right here. And there is our main current sense resistor. So, so I'm just gonna take a measurement here and confirm we're not shorted at the main current sense resistor. Back to our motherboard. I've located PR300, which is this one right here. So this is our current sense resistor. So once again, with my multimeter in diode mode, with my red probe on ground, I place my black probe to the current sense resistor, and I find that it measures 0 0.643. So there's no short at the current sense resistor, which is where our main power rail is. So having established that there's no short all the way along that input section, I'm going to go ahead and inject voltage at DCN and see what happens. So let me show you how to set that up. Now before I inject anything at all, I want to confirm what the voltage is on the power adapter. So I found a genuine XPS 159560 power adapter and this is what it looks like. It's a big block, isn't it? So when I zoom in on that, you can see it's a 130 watt. 19.5 volt 6 amp so we need to inject 19.5 volts so I introduce my DC power supply I set it to 19.5 volts DC I connected my black wire to ground and I connected my red wire to pins 1, 2 and 3 of PQ200 and let's see what happens So as you can see, I have my power hooked up to the board. Apologies for having the HDMI cable across. There's nothing I can do about this because my power supply is over this side and the cable needs to come in here. But you can see what's happening. The black wire is connected to ground and the red wire is connected into the source pins of PQ200. So let's power on and see what happens. Okay, so it's drawing 1600 milliamps pretty stably. Okay, well that looks pretty good. So if I press the power button, which is on the front of the laptop here, uh, did anything happen there? Oh, sorry, I didn't press it properly. Okay, so we have a light on the front of the laptop. It's now drawing 1300, 1400 milliamps. Still got a light in the front, so do we get a screen? Oh. All right, it's just gone off again, and the current draw now has gone down to 0 0.001 amps. Now, many times when I've been working on a laptop that has suffered a spill, I've found that the BIOS battery has been completely discharged through whatever short was created by the spill. So I took a voltage measurement at this BIOS battery, which is meant to read 3 volts, and I found that it was measuring 0, 0.0 volts. So this battery was completely discharged through whatever short was created by the spill. After I removed the BIOS battery, I noticed that it was significantly smaller than the CR2032. But they're both 3 volt batteries. So what I was able to do was remove the tape from around the existing battery, Take the black plate and tape it to the bottom of a CR2032. Take the red plate, tape it to the top of the CR2032, and then verify on my cable that I had 3 volts. So I plugged that into the laptop, verified that I had 3 volts on the board, but when I powered it on, it had the same fault. It would come on for 10 to 15 seconds and shut off. So even though the battery, the bias battery was fully discharged it has nothing to do with the fault. I tried powering on this motherboard a number of times and it keeps doing the same thing. It powers on for about 10 to 15 seconds and then shuts down again. So I thought maybe the best thing to do at this point was to take out my thermal camera. So when I switched it on for that period of 10 to 15 seconds when it stays powered on and the light stays on the only component that heats up 
is that large component in the center right there which I think is the GPU so that's obviously not good news that that's heating up I sweeped across the board just to confirm that there was no other components that were heating up and as you can see from my thermal camera really the only component that's heating up is that GPU just a quick correction I've checked the schematic for this motherboard and UH1 which is this component here is the CPU the GPU is actually UV18 which is this component right beside it so the one that's heating up when I turn on my thermal camera is the CPU Since the CPU is the only component that's heating up before it shuts down, I thought it might be a good idea to check for shorts around the capacitors that are beside the CPU. So I introduced my multimeter in resistance mode this time. I normally use diode mode, but I think it might be more useful to other people working on this laptop to have a resistance measurement for the processor. So I'm taking these measurements, of course, with the power switched off. So I place my red probe to one side of this capacitor and the black probe to the other side. And I find a resistance there measures 55 ohms. At the next capacitor, I measured a resistance of 16.9 ohms. And at the last bank of capacitors right beside that CPU, I take a resistance measurement again with the power off. And I find that it also measures 55 ohms. So what do those measurements tell me? Well I'm reading 55 ohms, 16.9 ohms and 55 ohms across those capacitors that are near the CPU. So I don't think there's a short across the CPU. But still it's the only component that's heating up before the laptop shuts down. Now you've seen me working on motherboards before where I can test it without putting the heatsink back on the CPU and I can get it to go to the power on self test just to verify that the board is back working again. Obviously I wouldn't leave the heatsink off or the fan off for long periods of time but when you're testing it's a lot quicker just to leave off the heatsink and the fan in order to see if it's actually working or not. However this motherboard is larger and draws larger current so I'm just curious is thermal protection kicking in and shutting this down to protect the CPU one thing that is certainly leading me in that direction is the fact that when I power it on from cold it seems to stay on a few seconds longer any subsequent boots it seems to shut down more quickly now my difficulty with this is I don't have a heatsink with this laptop motherboard it just it didn't come with one so what I'm going to try and do I'm going to try and take the heatsink from another laptop hold it down onto the CPU with my hand and see if I can get this to boot I'm back to our motherboard again now I found this spare heatsink that I'm going to use I'm going to try and hold it down onto the processor myself but as you can see the shape doesn't really fit this motherboard so what I need to do is just pull this piece of tissue paper right here to stop it from shorting anything out there so let me put it in and fit it on yeah I think that will work I'm going to power it on I'm going to hold that down with my hand okay so we try and power it on so I'm pressing the power button so we've got a light on and I'm going to press and hold the heatsink down onto the processor. So it's currently drawing 800, would you believe it? The light has stayed on but we also have Dell Support Assist, XPS 159560. We have a working motherboard, would you believe it? So that concludes my video for this week. We now have a working Dell XPS 15 9560 motherboard. I may contact the original seller and see if he still has the actual laptop chassis because I think this is quite a nice laptop. Post down in the comments below if you have one of these or if you think it's worth me actually chasing up on this. And that also completes my work on the four motherboards that I got that were labelled as not powering on from eBay. Out of the four, 
I've got two of them back working again. So it's 50% success rate, which I'm very happy with. I also haven't given up on board number three, which is the board that I did the comments uh, video about last week. I'm going to do a bit more work on that and see if I can get my success rate up to 75%. Thanks for watching along. I'm going to buy some more stuff during the week and we're going to try and repair it next weekend.